Now that we understand the mechanism of serine proteases and have an idea about inhibitors, let's take a look at a specific example. This is an irreversible inhibitor of serine proteases. It's actually the nerve gas, sarin. And what we really want to understand here is why is it able to mimic the naturally occurring substrate? Sarin, this organophosphorus inhibitor with the structure shown here, doesn't look anything like the peptide substrate. So how is it that there's a role of molecular mimicry that goes on here? Well, the mechanism follows the normal course of action. There's an addition step that, that creates this pentacoordinated intermediate. There's a beta elimination step. We cause that phosphorus fluorine bond to be eliminated. And then here's where deception basically takes place. What this enzyme is so good at is stabilizing the tetrahedral intermediate with that oxyanion hole. But here we have a tetrahedral geometry at phosphorus, but no oxyanion. And so while the oxyanion is quite unstable and still able to undergo further reaction, this tetrahedral geometry of this phosphotriester mimics the geometry of the naturally occurring transition state and intermediate that the enzyme is so good at stabilizing, but it isn't going to be as reactive. It's actually much more stable because it is not going to have the oxygen anion. And so it's deceiving the enzyme into thinking it it's stabilizing this structure that it's so good to sta so good at stabilizing this reactive tetrahedral intermediate. But in fact, in this case, it's not reactive at all. So that's the mechanism of irreversible inhibition by the nerve gas sarin. Let's take a look at a suicide inhibitor. And in this case, this chloromethylketone inhibitor actually sends the reaction down the normal pathway. You can see that there's a structure that looks an awful lot like phenylalanine. And so there's some recognition that's going on with respect to something that looks like the naturally occurring substrate. But we've got this chloromethyl group out here that's going to fool the enzyme into doing something that it doesn't want to do. It's going to end up uh, undergoing a different mode of reaction as the reaction sets in place. So the normal reaction takes place. Histidine is a general base. It promotes the nucleophile addition. It creates a tetrahedral intermediate. But here's where things go wrong. Rather than doing a beta elimination that kicks out in uh, that normally would kick out the group that would have a leaving group in this position, there isn't a leaving group in this position, and so something else has to take place. Remember, under normal conditions, this bond would break the bond that would be between the carbonyl carbon and the adjacent carbon, but notice that the chloromethyl group has an additional atom inserted in there. So something different takes place. It finds a way to displace this chloride. That's an SN2 type reaction that takes place intramolecularly. And so the enzyme has been deceived. It was forced under normal mode of action to make the tetrahedral intermediate, but then it creates a completely different species, which is quite toxic to the enzyme. This three-membered epoxide ring is really a very good electrophile. And the nearby histidine, and it's a mitazole ring after deprotonation is an excellent nucleophile to react with that epoxide ring. So the sp2 hybridized nitrogen is ready to act as a nucleophile. It's going to add into that epoxide three-membered strain, three-membered ring, another SN2 type displacement. And suddenly, what's been created is a new covalent bond between the imidazole nitrogen and the substrate that's now also bound to the inhibitor. So there's a connectivity from that basically this is serving as a, a cross link. It's coming around from the peptide bond here over histidine 57 through the connectivity that I'm showing you there back to the backbone part over here, serine 195. There's an internal covalent bond network that's been formed that basically blocks that substrate, any further binding of the substrate. And so we call this a suicide inhibitor because the inhibitor basically sends the enzyme down its normal pathway until there's a new mode of reaction that has to kick in since we've blocked the normal mode of reaction.